One of my favorite topics to discuss is this topic of nitric oxide. And this theme has come up multiple times whenever we discuss brain and mental health. And so no one knows the subject better than the next person I'm about to bring up, which is Dr. Nathan Bryan. So Dr. Uh, Bryan earned his undergraduate degree in Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from the University of Texas at Austin. He got his doctorate degree from Louisiana State University School of Medicine, where he was recipient of the Dean's Award for Excellence in Research. Uh, he has postdoctorate um, at Boston University School of Medicine and the Whitaker Cardiovascular Institute. And Dr. Brian joined the faculty at University of uh, Texas uh, Health Science Center here in Houston um, and worked with a very famous person, Dr. Farid Murad, who is a 1998 Nobel laureate in the medicine of physiology. Dr. Brian's uh, life has been really dedicated to involvement of nitric oxide research and has been for over the last 20 years and has had seminal discoveries in the field. Um, he is here to really talk about the understanding of how nitric oxide really plays a huge role into brain health. So he's a successful entrepreneur as well, founder of uh, Human N, uh, as well as Bryant Nutraceuticals, and is um, he's been responsible for uh, creation of a lot of really well-known products in the nitric oxide space. Uh, during COVID-19, um, he led a drug trial called Novirusid, which is currently in phase three clinical trials for the treatment of COVID-19 in African Americans, Hispanic, utilizing nitric oxide. And so without further ado, I'm going to bring Dr. Brian to the summit. So Dr. Brian, thanks for coming on and us speaking again. It's been a while. Appreciate you. Yes, great to see you. Good to be with you. Good seeing you. So, you know, we've been talking about this nitric oxide deal uh, throughout this summit. And for those of you who are just listening to this segment alone, what I'm talking about is one of the substances that we are required to survive and that most people are have some sort of deficiencies in and that translate into not just brain health but overall health as well. But of course, the summit's about better brain health. So we're going to talk about that. So uh, let's talk about nitric oxide. So Dr. Brian, you are the expert uh, in this topic. So let's talk about why is nitric oxide important when it comes to brain and mental health? Well, good. It's, it's my favorite subject, obviously. You know, I've been in the nitric oxide space for more than 20 years, but with over 185,000 papers published in the scientific literature, it's clear that nitric oxide is one of the most important molecules produced in the human body. It's what regulates and controls blood flow and circulation to every organ, tissue, and cell in the body. Uh, it's how our immune system fights off invading pathogens from viruses to bacteria. Uh, and it's a neurotransmitter of the central nervous system. So when we talk about brain health, we're talking about neurotransmission, but we're also talking about perfusion and circulation. And we know that people with neurological disorders, whether it's bipolar, Alzheimer's, um, vascular dementia, Parkinson's, that's all characterized by reduced blood flow to certain regions of the brain. So if we can restore blood flow and circulation and oxygen and nutrient delivery to every cell in the body, then those cells can perform. Without it, they fail, the tissue becomes dysfunctional, we develop end organ disease, and that's typically the, the death of many people. In fact, it's the number one reason for the loss of nitric oxide is the reason for the number one killer of men and women worldwide, which is heart attack, cardiovascular disease. Right. And of course, especially since the pandemic, we know that nitric oxide depleted people um, tend to have the highest risk for COVID-19. And then we also know during COVID that those people who are more sedentary elderly, so these are people who are already at risk for low nitric oxide. Um, if they were to do things that increase nitric oxide, um, which is exercise, eating right, stuff like that, they actually decrease their uh, mortality and mobility for COVID-19. And so that's I right. think that's something that, that's rooted in our immune system, like you said, and rooted in longevity. Now, why do you think it is that a lot of people are depleted? And what percentage of the population are, are kind of depleted in nitric oxide? Well, the best estimates are 50% of the people over the age of 40 have compromised nitric oxide production, what we call endothelial dysfunction, meaning their endothelial cells aren't functional to produce these vasoactive substances, including nitric oxide, to regulate blood flow. 
And that's kind of on a broad, broad level. But, you know, the data also tell us that we lose about 10 to 12 percent of our endothelial function per decade. And this starts in the late teens, early 20s. And a lot of this is dependent upon diet and lifestyle. You know, when you, you know, sedentary lifestyle leads to nitric oxide deficiency, you know, a poor diet, a high carb, high processed food all leads to an end glycation product on the NOS enzyme, which causes disruption in nitric oxide production. Interestingly, we're finding that people who use mouthwash disrupt the oral microbiome and become nitric oxide deficient. And that's 200 million Americans that wake up every morning and use mouthwash. You know, it makes no sense to me because, you know, we, we know not to take antibiotics chronically. We don't take antibiotics every day of our life because we know it disrupts the, the microbiome and causes a lot of mm. problems. So why would you use a mouthwash, an antiseptic mouthwash, every day to disrupt the oral microbiome? So that's a major problem. The other thing is fluoride. Fluoride in the drinking water, fluoride in the toothpaste. Fluoride's an antiseptic. It's killing the good bacteria, the bad bacteria. It's a neurotoxin, and it disrupts your thyroid function. And then the other problem is antacids. Uh, you know, antacids, specifically proton pump inhibitors, or PPIs, disrupt nitric oxide production. And now we know that there's data showing that people who have been on PPIs for three to five years have about a 35 to 40 percent higher incidence of heart attack and stroke because of the disruption of nitric oxide production. So if you look at the American population, the American diet, we're not getting the right nutrients we need. All Americans are, two out of three Americans are using mouthwash. There are over 200 million prescriptions written for proton pump inhibitors every year. That's not even counting the over-the-counter purchases. Uh, and Americans are sedentary by design. We get in our car, drive to our office, sit in a chair all day, and then drive home, and you know, we're, we're not active. So it's really no mystery to me why we have the sickest population. Everything we do disrupts nitric oxide production and the clinical consequences are obvious. So you mentioned earlier, and just want to define, uh, you said endothelial cells, and these are cells that are responsible for this production of nitric oxide. So where are the endothelial cells and what is the trigger that triggers them to make this nitric oxide? It's a very good question. So taking a step back, we know that the body, there's two ways the body makes nitric oxide. One is through an enzyme called nitric oxide synthase, and that's located in the endothelial cells. So the endothelial cells are the single layer of cells that line every blood vessel throughout the body. Hmm. It's, it's, it's found in the lymphatic system. So it's basically how you get the good stuff in, the bad stuff out. So this enzyme nitric oxide synthase, it's stimulated by you know, sheer stress. So when we begin to exercise, so if we, hit, we see an increase in, in blood flow, that tells the endothelial cells, I need to make more nitric oxide to deliver more oxygen and nutrients to these downstream tissues. And if you can do that, then your body performs normally. If you can't, then you develop exercise intolerance. We're finding you develop insulin resistant type two diabetes. You develop mild cognitive disorders. You develop cardiovascular disease. Uh, it's, so it's the earliest event in the onset and progression of every major age-related chronic disease. So to answer your question, it's the function of the endothelial cells or the endothelial cells ability to produce nitric oxide when stimulated, when activated, that determine your health and how resilient you are to not just pathogens, viral infections, but also the early onset of Alzheimer's or neurological disease or even cardiovascular disease. Right. So how does um so so earlier we, we talked about uh nitric oxide being along like lymphatics and being along blood vessels are all over the body right and there's also uh it's the brain has its own lymphatics called the glymphatics and its own blood vessels and its own nitric oxide and we know that um a lot of brain health related disorders whether it's alzheimer's and strokes and stuff like that stems from this this long period of chronic depletion of this production of nitric oxide. And so I guess in theory, what we have to promote then is behaviors and things that we can do to increase our nitric oxide over time. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. It's truly the holy grail and not just cardiovascular medicine, but really systemic medicine. It affects every organ, tissue, and, and cell in the body. And it's right. more than that. So, you know, we talk about perfusing, getting enough blood flow <clears throat> to these organs, including the brain. But all diseases are characterized by three fundamental problems. It's inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction. 
And when nitric oxide is sufficiently produced by the endothelium, it decreases inflammation, it decreases mm. oxidative stress, and it inhibits the immune dysfunction. So without nitric oxide, you don't get blood flow, you get inflammation, you get oxidative stress, and you get immune dysfunction. And those are the hallmarks of every single chronic disease, no matter where in the body it is. Okay, well, let's tie in breathing for a second, because in another part of the segment, we talked about how our ability to uh, take air in through the nose around the uh, paranasal sinuses is able to actually help us also to produce this nitric oxide. So how important is this process? Well, we talk about the endothelial cells where the nitric oxide enzyme is found, but they're also found in the epithelial cells. So the endothelial cells are found in the lining of the blood vessels. The epithelial cells are found in the, the, the sinuses and the airways all the way down to the, the, the bronchioles and the, alve the al alveoli. Right, in the lungs, so when, right. we, when we deep breathe and when we do nasal breathing, that creates sheer stress. There's mechanoreceptors on these epithelial cells and it tells the epithelial cells to make nitric oxide. But if the nitric oxide synthase enzyme is dysfunctional and uncoupled, then we can't generate any nitric oxide even though we're, no, we're nasal breathing. So the beauty of this is if you have endothelial dysfunction, you have epithelial dysfunction. The same conditions that cause endothelial dysfunction Will cause uncoupling of the NOS enzyme in the epithelium. So where it's still good to breathe, to do nasal breathing and nose breathing, you know, we're compromised if we don't do the things to restore nitric oxide production. And a fundamental discovery about seven years ago revealed that nitric oxide is required for oxygen delivery to the periphery. So the cardiorespiratory cycle is a three gas system. So prior to this, we thought, well, okay, we breathe in oxygen, right? right? We deliver that oxygen, and we exchange it with the blood in the, in the lungs, and then we excrete carbon dioxide. But now we're recognizing that nitric oxide is the third gas that's required in the system. Hmm. Because nitric oxide is required for oxygen to be offloaded from hemoglobin to right. deliver that to the periphery. And that's been obvious in COVID patients because you see these people desaturate, meaning their blood oxygen saturation goes from normally 98, 99 down to you know, sometimes the high 70s, low 80s, and it's critical. And you put them on 100% oxygen, yet their oxygen saturation doesn't improve. It's because they don't have the nitric oxide signaling aspect to mm. restore that oxygen saturation. And that's the beauty of our nitric oxide drug now we have in phase three trials for COVID. Once we restore the functionality of nitric oxide, we see blood oxygen saturations go from 78 to 98 within a period of eight minutes. So the, the most important thing that most people don't realize is that you need nitric oxide to take up oxygen and deliver oxygen to every cell in the body. Without it, you don't deliver oxygen. Okay, so it's not just about the exchange of carbon dioxide breathing okay. out, oxygen coming in. Nitric oxide itself is, is a gas, um, and that gas is also required for that exchange, the handoff of oxygen to be delivered to our body through to binding of hemoglobin, which is what makes our blood red. That's and and gosh, I can't tell you how many people I found to be like have low iron, which means they have low hemoglobin and anemic. And that low iron is really an undertreated phenomenon that's happening in the United States. And that also uh, is hugely implicated in the less exchange of the oxygen to the body that's supposed to be facilitated by nitric oxide, right? That's exactly right. And I think the iron, the, the low iron, can be related back to the use of antacids. You know, the stomach can absorb iron or B vitamins mm -hmm. or a lot of other trace minerals and nutrients without stomach acid production. So this epidemic and you know, the people that are on antacids become anemic, they become low in vitamin D, they become low in B vitamins, selenium, chromium. And as we know now and recognize that most human diseases are caused by two things and two things only. The human body is missing something that it needs or it's exposed to something that it doesn't need. And most mm -hmm. Americans are depleted in some one or more nutrients. Right. And on the topic of antacids, and I think this is sort of the general principle of medicine, the current modern medicine, is that there is a symptom that's inconvenient. We try to suppress that symptom with the drug, but no one really looks at what happens over a long period of time when you do it. So even when you go to the store and pop some Tums because you have acid reflux, your body's telling you not to eat what you just ate, but you pop some Tums and, and continue eating that's whatever right. you eat. And that has huge, huge implications for, for absorption, for digestion. And over time, that depletes your body's nitric oxide. 
production and that turns into whatever disease we put at the end of it you know alzheimer's okay. or disease or or anxiety bipolar or ptsd uh, a lot of these issues that, that really pop up so if if all if everything here if if most chronic diseases are a lack of something or too much of something that we our bodies just doesn't need and nitric oxide is sort of like the middle equation there can nitric oxide be supplemented what do you think yeah absolutely so we've got you know about 15 years of clinical data on ways to restore nitric oxide production in the human body mm -hmm. So we can do, and the challenge for this over the past 30 years, you know, big pharma has failed at making a safe and effective nitric oxide therapy because nitric oxide is a gas and it's a gas with a half-life of less than one second, meaning when it's produced in the human body, mm -hmm. it activates some signaling, some targets, and then it's gone. It takes less than a second to activate the signaling pathway. So the challenge has been, how do you create a bioactive gas in a solid dose form that's shelf stable that's activated when put in the human body. That's kind of the holy grail in, in medicine. And we cracked the code on that, um, I guess about man, almost 20 years ago, 15 years ago. So I've probably dozens of issued US international patents on ways to restore nitric oxide. The first way we did this was through a lozenge, an orally disintegrating lozenge. And when you put this lozenge in your mouth, it's activated by your saliva and this matrix slowly falls apart. And as it falls apart, these active components come together and generate nitric oxide gas. So if your body can't make nitric oxide, we do it for you. But we also understand the enzymology to the extent that we can recouple the NOS enzyme and improve the body's own ability to make nitric oxide. So you can do this through a lozenge, which is our primary delivery. We've made some fermented beet powders that, um, you know, beets have become a very popular item in terms of supplementation and exercise performance. Uh, we've perfected this through a fermentation process where we can, you know, concentrate the nitric oxide activity. And then you pour this in water, you take it as a shot, and we can uh, improve performance that way. So that's how you supplement it in terms of nutrition and supplements. But we've also got, you know, drugs that we're developing through the FDA for, for specific indications. We've got a COVID drug in phase three clinical trials. We're about to enter a, a phase three trial for ischemic non-obstructive coronary artery disease, a growing condition which there's no effective therapy. And then we've got a pilot study going in for Alzheimer's because we recognized kind of the topic of the summit that people that get Alzheimer's or vascular dementia or even mild cognitive disorders are the people who have poor circulation. And that's data from Daniel Amen showing that through SPEC scans that these neurological conditions are characterized by decreased blood flow or perfusion to certain regions of the brain and then the neurological symptoms come on. And then we developed a topical nitric oxide drug for diabetic ulcers or non-healing ulcers. So I think, and we think that this is the way patients are gonna be treated in the future because there's no indication that we could even think of where nitric oxide at the right dose, at the right time and the right patient would not be beneficial. Mm. So, well, this is different than, than most pharmaceutical drugs. I mean, most pharmaceutical drug, once again, it's trying to treat a symptom or right. some sort of a number that's there, right? Whereas the nitric oxide uh, repletion is to is to have restore of, of some level of function, right? Yeah, no, that's right. Most drug discovery programs are inhibitors of certain enzymes in the body. So whether this are like COX-2 inhibitors, the Vioxx, Celebrex drugs, the um, mm -hmm. you know COX inhibitors like aspirin and NSAIDs. So you're inhibiting a specific enzyme. That's different than what we do. What we do in our drug discovery is called restorative physiology. So mm. we're basically giving back what the body is missing. We're not inhibiting some enzyme. We're restoring normal physiological function in a way that's truly restorative. So when you do that, we don't expect any side effects. In fact, we've dosed over 500 patients with very sick COVID patients, no side effects, no adverse events. In fact, the only, the, the only um, reaction is that they get better. So I think that goes to the point that if we use restorative physiology in our drug discovery and drug design and give the nitric oxide at the right dose at the right time to the right patient, again, there's no indication where we think we wouldn't provide benefit to the patient. Right. So lots of benefit, low risk, right? Yeah, well, it's, it's all dose dependent, as you know. You know, too little nitric oxide is bad. We know too much nitric oxide is bad. But the toxicity is defined by two things and two things only. 
It's low blood pressure, and we haven't mm -hmm. seen any unsafe drop in blood pressure in our COVID studies. And the other is a condition called met hemoglobinemia, where if you take a lot of nitric oxide, you oxidize the heme hemoglobin, the heme iron and hemoglobin, and you reduce the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. But you will see an unsafe drop in blood pressure long before you ever see any met hemoglobin formation. So what we do is we have it's, it's given the right dose at the right time. We know how much nitric oxide a normal healthy human makes, and we dial that level in through all of our nitric oxide technology. Great. So aside from uh, supplementations and pharmacotherapeutics, what are some things that our listeners can do uh, at home starting tomorrow uh, to improve their nitric oxide production naturally? Well, it's very simple. Nitric oxide is a very complex, complicated science, but the mm -hmm. solution is really very simple. And mm -hmm. it's two things. Stop doing the things that disrupt nitric oxide production and start doing things that promote it. So if we, if we dig a little deeper in that, so what's disrupting nitric oxide production? Number one, we don't eat enough green leafy vegetables. It's the primary source of inorganic nitrate that the body uses to make nitric oxide. So throw in more green leafy vegetables. The other thing, if you're using mouthwash, you have to stop. We're disrupting the oral microbiome. We're causing an increase in blood pressure and we lose the benefits of exercise if you use mouthwash. The other thing is get rid of fluoride. Use fluoride-free toothpaste. Don't drink municipal water. Get you a water filtration system to remove the fluoride from the water you drink, you bathe in, you cook in. And then if you're on antacids, you have to figure out a way to wean yourself off of antacids. These drugs were never approved for chronic use. They're only approved for acute use three to five days for acid reflux. But yet people have been on these for many, many years and the, the consequences are, are severe. So if you just stop doing those things, your body will thank you because now it's able to perform, it's able to produce nitric oxide. And then to add to that, start exercising. We need moderate physical exercise. Uh, get out in the sun, 20 to 30 minutes of sunlight a day. There's certain wavelengths of light, both UV and infrared, near infrared, that stimulate nitric oxide production. And then when all else fails, you can take some uh, safe and effective nitric oxide products that we develop over the years. Right. And of course, stuff like cigarettes and pollution stuff also deplete. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Cigarette smoking is bad. I'll, I'll, in fact, every major cardiovascular risk factor yeah. disrupts nitric oxide production. So just stop doing the things that we know are bad for us. Start doing the things that are clinically proven to be beneficial. And most of those will promote nitric oxide. production. How important is sleep in this equation? Well, sleep is absolutely critical. I mean, we, when we sleep, it's how our body repairs, right? So we're regenerative beings. And so mm -hmm. when we sleep at night, it's how our body repairs and replaces dysfunctional cells. So in order for that to happen, we've got to be able to deliver oxygen and nutrients, what we need to make a new cell that works properly during our sleep. But if we have obstructive sleep apnea or we have disrupted sleep patterns and we're not delivering oxygen in the raw materials, to the cells that need to be replaced or repaired, then we develop organ dysfunction and we develop symptoms. And then if the symptoms aren't resolved, we develop chronic disease. So the body cannot and will not heal without sleep because we're not delivering oxygen and the body will not and cannot heal or perform optimally without nitric oxide. So it's all tied together. Everything we know about health and well being uh, revolves around the production or the delivery of oxygen, which is dependent upon the production of nitric oxide. So, and, and I think another few points about sleep is that um, most people who have chronic acid reflux is actually from chronic sleep disorders or insomnia or sleep apnea. And if you just increase your sleep, increase your quality sleep or work with your, doc work with your doctor on any sleep disorders, that can eventually help you take you off of uh, the chronic acid blockers, right? And then sleep also can stabilize your, your blood pressure. So it can possibly take you off of blood pressure medicine uh, if, if it all goes well. And I think that is, uh, you're right, that part of that restoration is leads to uh, downstream things that can improve nitric oxide and take away the bad things that, uh, that deplete it. Now, uh, I want to go back to mouthwash for, for a sec, because you were the first person to tell me that years ago uh, about mouthwash, and I was really shocked, right? Um, 
So mouthwash and antiseptics are basically uh, almost like an antibiotic hit to your, your oral cavity, right? And so, um, and most people don't understand that there is such a thing as healthy bacteria that's in the mouth. And uh, just like there's healthy bacteria that's in the gut. And so it's so interesting that when you take that away, we're seeing these issues. But, you know, a lot of uh, conventional dentists and doctors have been saying a long time to utilize mouthwash. Where's the disconnect here? Well, you know, the, and I speak at a lot of these dental conferences now trying to raise this awareness. And, you know, the number one response I get back is, well, that's the way we've always done it. Yeah. Like, well, there's something called progress in science and medicine. And if we continue to do the things we've always done, in despite yeah. of all the progress and new understandings, then you're doing your patients a disservice. But did, did Dennis look at obviously periodontal disease, the gingival tissue, and there's yeah. certain bacteria that are known to cause periodontal disease and gingivitis. And there's what's called the oral systemic link that people with you know, poor oral hygiene, gingivitis, periodontal disease have an increased risk of heart attack and stroke. So what's the mechanism? For years, people thought it was translocation of the bacteria because you can find those bacteria in the plaque of an MI of a person that suffered acute cardiac arrest. But it's more than that. It's disruption of nitric oxide. So when we talk about the microbiome, we now understand how important the microbiome is. Early investigators focused on the gut, the, the microbiome of the GI tract. We started focusing on the oral microbiome about 15 years ago where it became apparent that if you use mouthwash, and disrupt this community of bacteria, we saw an increase in blood pressure. And then that led us to the discovery that there are nitrate reducing bacteria that live on the crypts of the tongue that reduce inorganic nitrate from the foods we eat into nitrite and nitric oxide. And that regulates systemic blood pressure. So we and others have published, if you take people and you give them mouthwash for seven days, we see an increase in blood pressure. If you take mm -hmm. people and you use mouthwash and you exercise, you lose the cardioprotective benefits of exercise. So the antiseptic is going in, especially alcohol-based mouthwash, is they indiscriminately kill bacteria. They kill the good guys, they kill the bad guys. And this whole ecology of the microbiome in the mouth, the more diverse the, the ecology, the better the oral health. And it's like anything, the good guys keep the bad guys out. And it's a true symbiotic relationship, meaning we need these bacteria that live in and on our body to do things that we as humans can't be. And we are, when we eradicate these bacteria through overuse of antibiotics, through using uh, antiseptic mouthwash, then bad things happen. There are clinical consequences to disrupting the microbiome. Right. Let's shift the topic a little bit to mental health. Um, now, we've been talking about cardiovascular and brain health, but the same conversation really applies in mental health. For example, you know, attention deficit disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, we know those are nitric oxide depleted um, states. We know that chronic anxiety, chronic insomnia, uh, we know that um, bipolar disorder, right? These are nitric oxide depleted states. But we're, we're seeing this, and it's so common to see this within the younger population. And now it's really normal for, you know, a kid to walk into class and he has a prescription for Vivance or Ritalin or something like that, right? And so uh, can you relate that to sort of this nitric oxide process and what we can do about it? Yeah, you know, everything we're exposed to, whether it's, you know, and it's the foods we eat, you know, there's, there's uh, herbicides, pesticides on a lot of food. In fact, the recent data I read was 85% of people in America have glyphosate or Roundup that's detected in the urine. So we're exposed to these things. And glyphosate obviously disrupts nitric oxide production. There's data coming out that 5G, that frequency, disrupts nitric oxide production. Uh, poor diet, sedentary lifestyle, soft drinks, everything that really young kids do today is disrupting nitric oxide production. And it's leading to not just neurological issues, but you know, you're seeing young men in their early 20s presenting with erectile dysfunction. I mean, and that's that should be the prime of your life in terms of blood flow and performance. And yet we're seeing it in late teens, early twenties, which is a nitric oxide deficiency problem. So if you have endothelial dysfunction in the coronary arteries and develop angina, then you have endothelial dysfunction in the vascular beds of the sex organs. You've got endothelial dysfunction in the vascular bed of the cerebral arteries. 
uh, everywhere. So it's not limited to just cardiovascular disease. It's every organ has to regulate its own blood flow and perfusion and be able to increase blood flow upon demand. Whether it's in the brain and you're trying to recall memory or whether it's to the sex organs when you're you know, trying to have uh, a sexual encounter, you have to increase blood flow in order for that organ to work. And that's the role of nitric oxide. Right. And uh, on another part of the summit, I interviewed Dr. Felix Liao, uh, uh, oral health and oral airway dentist. And we talked about nitric oxide in a very interesting way. I've, I've never thought about this before. But um, we talked about how a lot of kids and even adults these days um, have obstructive airway disease, either obstructive a- uh, apnea, uh, tongue ties, and high pellets, um, so much so that when they breathe at nighttime, their tongues can't occlude the top part of the palate, so it decreases the amount of air coming into the paranasal sinuses, and therefore that decreases the local nitric oxide you know, production. And so um, what we were talking about is how prevalent this sort of physiology is in adolescents and even adults with the ADD and ADHD. And um, one of the biggest implicators in, in really mental health is, is oral airway disease. Okay. And so I think that um, as we talk about you know, nitric oxide as a thing, um, but let's talk about repletion. So, you know, obviously breathing is, is important. Taking away the, um, the, the, the mouthwashes. By the way, is it all mouthwashes or just some mouthwashes? Well, it's, it's any antiseptic mouthwash. I mean, we've tested things like chlorhexidine, which is a prescription mouthwash used for chronic halitosis patients. We've tested Listerine, scope, alcohol-based mouthwashes. Anything that indiscriminately kills the bacteria and disrupts the microbiome causes a disruption in nitric oxide production. All right. Okay. So, um, so, so knowing that, and then of course, trying to uh, eliminate uh, fluoride, which can be really hard because even a lot of the, the, the healthy toothpaste tends to have fluoride as well these days. Um, and then, and then understanding that uh, a lot of our body's uh, needs are met whenever we do things that, that increase nitric oxide. Is there, do you, do you see any disease state, any disease state at all that uh, can be harmed by, by increasing nitric oxide? I'm not saying to high dangerous levels, but in, in general. No, we haven't. I mean, again, it's dose dependent. And if we give the amount of nitric oxide that we know is restorative, there's not a single disease that would be counter, uh, counterintuitive or contraindicated. You know, early on, we thought sepsis now, because the problem in sepsis is you get, you know, a loss of blood pressure, you get uh, loss of perfusion to organs, and then you develop end organ failure, and that's how people die of sepsis. But years ago, probably 20 years ago, they developed some nitric oxide inhibitors that they used in a clinical trial in septic patients just to see if they could prevent the loss of pressure and, and, and perfuse the organs. And what they found was in that clinical trial was that the, the inhibitors of nitric oxide production actually made the condition worse. In fact, they stopped the trial. So that told us that it's probably not ni- overproduction of nitric oxide that's leading to end organ failure and death in septic patients. It's something more complicated. So that would be the only thing that we could even rationalize in the nitric oxide field. But again, those data didn't turn out. But to answer your question, there's not a single indication or disease state or any symptoms that we thought where nitric oxide wouldn't be beneficial because it's delivering oxygen, delivering nutrients, preventing inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction to every tissue, organ, and cell in the body. So, you know, it, it, this reminds me kind of the, the topic of like stem cells, right? The stem cells is uh, the cells in our body that can differentiate and repair um, other cells uh, that are there. But once again, nitric oxide are also needed for stem cells to proliferate right. too. Right? Yeah, in, in 1996, there was a paper published showing that nitric oxide is the signal that tells our own stem cells to mobilize and differentiate. So if your body can't make nitric oxide, the stem cells don't mobilize and they don't know where to go, don't know what to do because they don't get the signal. So that leads to a loss of repair, a loss of uh, regeneration and the onset and progression of chronic disease. And more to that, you know, every single chronic disease is characterized by mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondria are the organelles that provide the cell the energy it needs. And nitric oxide is what controls and regulates mitochondrial biogenesis, 
and the efficiency of ATP or cellular energy production from oxygen. So we think nitric oxide is this unified theory of aging, whether it's loss of stem cell function, whether it's mitochondrial dysfunction or shortening of telomeres, nitric oxide is what controls all three of those. So you really, as I mentioned earlier, your body cannot and will not heal until you restore the production of nitric oxide. It's really that simple. Right. And so, you know, and, and this makes me really understand why that a lot of people who get like regenerative stem cell therapies and whatnot, if they're still doing habits that's depleting the nitric oxide, it may not work uh, just because <laughs> there's right. no signal there, right? Well, you know, the, you can see those data coming out now. That's the, the stem cell industry is kind of the wild, wild west because there's no standardization. People right. go in for different conditions, whether it's orthopedic or post-MI or neurological conditions. If we And we've got a number of stem cell clinics and docs that use our nitric oxide prior to yep. the mobilization and deployment of stem cells because we, the body needs that signal to where when you deploy the stem cell to do any regenerative medicine therapy, then the body's going to respond better. But you have to restore the nitric oxide in the body before you deploy any, any regenerative medicine type therapies, including stem cells. Right. And so, okay, so I want to tie this, uh, let's talk about sleep apnea for a second, because um, technically one in four humans have some sort of sleep apnea. So 25% of people watching this uh, have sleep apnea, and probably everyone knows someone with, with, with apneas, <laughs> or they snore, they just haven't been diagnosed yet, right? Um, now, sleep apnea uh, basically is the condition where at nighttime, people either stop breathing or have trouble breathing uh, because of either obstructive airway disease or the body telling them not to breathe for one reason or another, right? And so um, I have sleep apnea, so I know how, how, how this works, is that, you know, whenever that happens, there's a lot of signals uh, that gets thrown off, especially at nighttime, every time the oxygen level goes low. And the nitric oxide production just shuts off in, in, in okay. sleep apnea, right? And so um, if, and, and that's why uh, a lot of people in integrative health, you know, we talk about treating the sleep apnea is, is, is a non-negotiable, you know, if you're taking supplements, eating right and exercising, you're not treating the sleep apnea, then yeah. you can have completely depleted nitric oxide, right? Exactly. And so why is it um, that, well, let's, let's back up for a second. So earlier we talked about how there, there are, supplementations for nitric oxide in specific situations where you know whether it's like fermented beets or, or whatever like that right um is that enough to overcome someone with sleep issues or sleep apnea uh their their actual production of nitric oxide well i don't think it's enough to overcome it but people with destructive sleep apnea have to take some form of nitric oxide supplementation because their body's not making it and it's the same concept. If you're low in vitamin D, what do you do? You have to supplement vitamin D. If you're low in testosterone or estrogen, then we take, we have to supplement that and give the body back what it needs. And it's a two-way street. We need, we need oxygen to make nitric oxide. That enzyme requires oxygen. So if we're not delivering oxygen to the endothelial cells and vascular beds, then you can't make nitric oxide. And then if you can't make nitric oxide, you can't deliver that oxygen to the cells. And so it's, it's a perpetual cycle that you have to intervene through one or the other. And I think if you, as you mentioned, you have to correct the sleep apnea, but you also have to provide a source of nitric oxide until the body is able to generate that itself. And so this is obvious in, you know, most heart attacks occur before 10 a.m. in the morning. And I think that's because of people with obstructive sleep apnea or other risk factors for cardiovascular disease or heart attack is they sleep all night, they're not, they're hypoxic, they don't realize it, uh, and then they get up to start to, to move, and then their blood vessels can't dilate to support that. They're inflamed, the plaque ruptures, and that's heart attack and stroke. So the best thing you can do is take your nitric oxide at night before you go to bed so that if you're on a CPAP or any other type of sleep device, you're going to be able to better deliver that oxygen and prevent mm -hmm. the inflammation so that when you wake up in the morning, you don't suffer an acute MI and uh, you know, have early premature death. All right, you convinced me. I'll take that tonight before I put on my seat. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's great. And so, I, and one last question before we jump off. It's been such an interesting discussion. So um, earlier we talked about 
uh, this condition called sepsis. And for those of you listening who don't know, sepsis is basically a condition that the body becomes uh, when there's an infection and the infection spreads into the bloodstream. We call that septicemia and sepsis actually is the first stage of going towards death, <laughs> if you will. And when sepsis occurs, um, multiple organs, the brain, the heart, everything could be really affected. And when that occurs, the blood pressure can become low. We call that septic shock. So earlier we talked about, well, is septic shock, uh, the lowering of the blood pressure, is that too much nitric oxide um, in the blood vessels causing the, the blood pressure? And, uh, and the answer is no, because when they give nitric oxide blockers, blockers people just got worse. That's right. So, and and I, I mean, I'm saying this is because there's a lot of people who are listening to this right now that are on um, nitrous oxide type uh, medications like Isordil and stuff like that, right? Yep. And so, I, and I want people to understand those medications are not what we're talking about. They're not the, the same thing as we're talking about in terms of nitric oxide. But a lot of people, especially uh, people in the, in the cardiology field, uh, feel that maybe too much nitric oxide can lower the blood pressure in these, in these people. And the answer is no, right? And the answer is they probably need more nitric oxide to combat the actual infection because their immune system can be restored nitric oxide uh, rather than rather than having too much nitric oxide as a problem, right? Yeah, no, that's right. Those drugs are called organic nitrates. So things like nitroglycerin, isotorbide, or isodeal. Um, those drugs are metabolized into nitric oxide. And those have been used for probably 200 years now for the treatment of acute angina. And a lot of times they'll give them in, in post-infarct patients or patients who suffered a heart attack. The problem with those drugs are that they, you develop tolerance to them over time. And the outcome data show that people who have been on organic nitrates for a long period of time actually do worse. They get worse. So you develop mm. tolerance or what's called tachyphylaxis to those drugs because these are requiring mitochondrial enzymes to metabolize those into nitric oxide. What we do is completely different. We're not dependent upon the mitochondria, which most people, they're dysfunctional. We deliver nitric oxide gas through natural product chemistry that doesn't lead to any tolerance development, no unsafe drop in blood pressure. And so it's completely different. The overall objective is the same, it's to get nitric oxide, but the mechanism of getting that nitric oxide in the human body is completely different. Amazing. So yes, yeah, we really wanted to make that distinction because a lot of times we actually do prescribe the, the tablets uh, that you're talking about and the nitric oxide within the clinic. But there's a huge misconception uh, thinking that that's nitroglycerin that people take and, and the pharmaceutical drugs. Like, no, it's not it's not quite the same. It's quite the opposite, actually. Yep. So, you know, wonderful. So um, where can people find you to uh, learn more about the stuff and the products that you talk about? Where can people find all that stuff? Well, you know, I try to, I direct people, I have an educational website, it's drnathansbryan.com. Uh, I do a monthly Great. blog. Um, I encourage people to educate themselves on nitric oxide. You know, my job is not to sell you products. My job is to provide education so consumers can make informed decisions on what's best Excellent. for them and to listen to the advice of their healthcare practitioner and physician. But, you know, we've developed a number of really innovative nitric oxide products over the past um, couple of decades. We have a uh, a nitric oxide skincare system where we're, you know, the skin is an organ just like any other organ and without sufficient blood flow, it fails. So we developed a topical nitric oxide uh, product. It's n101.com. That's N as in nitric, the, the number one, O as in oxide, the number one.com. Uh, we'll provide a code for your listeners, a coupon code, they get 10% off and free shipping. And then our right. oral nitric oxide products are, are at no2u.com. That's N O the number two, the letter U.com. We have an orally disintegrating tablet. We have a fermented beet powder where we've taken the beet taste, the beet color, the beet pulp out of it. So it's a great tasting, sweet berry flavored uh, beet product. It's a, we put mitochondrial enzymes in there. So we improve energy production. We put electrolytes in there because most Americans are dehydrated. And that's a fantastic product. I think it will replace, you know, the five hour energy drinks or the monster drinks, the really unhealthy uh, things that people go to for natural energy. We provide natural energy in form of increased nitric oxide, better blood flow, better energy production, better hydration. And it's just great product technology. And then well, to find out- and 
we know but, that the five hour energy drinks and then the monsters actually decrease blood flow to the brain. <laughs> yeah, they're horrible. They're horrible drinks. And then to find out yeah. more about our drug studies, we've got a uh, nitric oxide innovations.com. We've got four drugs going into clinical trials now for specific indications. Uh, and we're very excited about that because we think we're going to change the landscape of healthcare and how patients are treated uh, the next hundred years. Well, listen, you are truly the bridge between innovation, science, and execution in the world of medicine through regeneration. You know, it's probably the, my best words to describe you. So well, I want to you. thank you for being in that in that position. I mean, this is uh, this is certainly a lot to take in. And for those listening, I know we use a lot of big words uh, here, but I, I challenge you. Uh, to create a high level of understanding by going to Dr. Brian's sites and checking it out. So once again, thanks for coming on to the summit. I truly appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. Ron. Appreciate all you do. Thank you.